Time Magazine has named him a hero of the environment. His film, Meet Mr. Toilet, has premiered at both Sundance Film Festival and also screened at Cannes Lions Festival. Mr. Sims arrives, from, uh, South, arrives in South Florida after being in New York, where he helped the United Nations mark World Toilet Day. The United Nations does not do this very often, and it is truly a fabulous recognition for his dedication and his work in this area. We're lucky to have him. There was a great write-up in the New York Times about this. Uh, we're very happy to have him speak with us today. He's going to talk about sustaining social enterprise, uh, something he knows quite a, bit, a deal about. Um, well, we can thank him and welcome him with a round of applause. He will come to the podium after the video. But please join me in welcoming him. pushing the button. Here we go. When we are children, our parents tell us not to talk about shit. This is a really serious problem. What you don't talk about, you cannot improve. A lot of people call me Mr. Toilet. I'm really proud when I hear that because it gives an identity to the work that I do. 40% of the world population still do not have access to a simple toilet. Shit is like fire. If you manage properly, the fire can cook your meal. If you don't manage it, it burns down your house. If you manage shit, it becomes a fertilizer. If you don't manage it, it kills you. About 90% of all the surface water in India are contaminated by feces. 1.5 million children under 5 per year in the world die unnecessarily. You have to have clean water, you have to have safe sanitation. A rich man staying next to a slum. The flies doesn't know a poor man from a rich man. So, the rich man is probably eating the shit of the poor man. You better help them get toilets, or you will eat their shit. Think about it. We are hosting the World Toilet Summit. This has been an international event every year since 2001. The people say, why should I use a toilet? It's fresh air outside. I can check check with my friend while I'm squatting there. A big breakthrough will happen when we look at the poor as if they are customers. We have to sell them products that are very beautiful and sexy. Once this becomes object of desire, if you don't have, you are not keeping up with the Jonas's. We want toilet to become a status symbol for the poor so that they feel proud to own a toilet. Just like a Louis Vuitton handbag. <laughs> we are actually breaking the taboo on sanitation in the global news. World Toilet Day is 19 November every year. We have the big squad. We are protesting the plight of the 2.5 billion people that still do not have access to a toilet. The fact is I think about toilet every moment. A life is only 80 years. I'm 52. If I'm going to spend 28 years consuming ostentatiously just to have a diamond watch that I can't read the time because it's too sparkling, it makes no sense. Doing social work that is creating some impact, I think it's better to die like that. I think we can see the day that everybody on planet Earth will have access to clean toilets any day, any time. <laughs>
without resource, without authority, you can still change a lot. Uh, whatever you are frustrated about, whatever you see as uh, social justice that has to be done, uh, you can do a lot of things uh, as long as you can get other people to do it. So if you were to do things yourself, and if you look at the limited resources that you have, chances are you will be uh, really contrived and you will say, maybe I'll just do whatever I can. But uh, don't stop there. If you start to think the whole world is just waiting to partner you, and they are all waiting to give you their resources, sometimes their money, most of the time it's harder to get money, but it's definitely easier to get their volunteerism or whatever else they can do for you. So this is about how to get almost everything for free. And the first look of this title, it might be a little bit skeptical. Is that possible? So we'll see. I started the World Toilet Organization, um, calling it the WTO. So that sounds like the World Trade Organization. And the whole strategy was intentional. When we first started, we know that our subject is really quirky. It is very difficult to get people to admit that they actually go to the toilet. So we thought we will use guerrilla marketing and the strategy is to write on other people's brand. So when we call ourselves WTO, the media love it very much. So two consequences can happen. One is we enjoy the media and the World Trade Organization don't notice us. Or they are busy. <laughs> and the second consequence might be that they get really upset and they will sue us. So if they sue us, then that will be a big win. Because then it will be in the news very, very loudly and they will win nothing. And we will win everything. So when you design something, sometimes you can design it with no downside. You either win or you win very big. So how do you get other people to do things? This is an American legend. Tom Sawyer was punished by Auntie Polly to paint the fence because he did something wrong. And in order to paint the fence, he was very upset because he does, he's a lazy guy. He doesn't want to paint the fence on a Sunday morning. So he started to pretend that he was enjoying painting the fence by singing songs and all that while painting the fence. When his friend came, his friend asked him, what are you doing? He says, I'm having fun. And his friend said, can I also paint? He says, no, unless you pay me. So he got a, a rat on the string which he can swing while his friend is painting the fence. Then next come other friends. So eventually, by the end of the day, the job was done by everybody, and he got a lot of souvenirs, like a penny or a broken lock or whatever. No, all these important precious things of his friends who surrendered for the privilege of painting the fence. So here's already a classic example that if you want to get people to do the job for you, you have to make it fun. And you have to make it very meaningful for them. And you have to only recruit qualified people. And in this case, the qualification is that they are interested enough to pay you. And at the end, when the job is finished, he got rewarded by Auntie Polly. Uh, with a good supper because Auntie Polly thought that he did it himself. So, so when I started, 
My life story is like that. I failed everything in school. <laughs> so I was under the academic category a failure. And so after uh, not having a university degree, I started to work as a salesperson in a Swiss company selling building materials. And because I don't have a degree, there was really no chance to be a manager. For some reason, anybody who don't have a degree can't be a manager. So I thought, well, why don't I start a business? So I started to import roofing tiles from France and sell to Singapore. And I realized that actually it's very easy to do business, much easier than studying. <laughs> so, I, how did I start to do a business? I don't have money. So I asked somebody to invest $100,000, out of which I will reserve $20,000, but I will pay by deduction of my salary. But if we make money earlier, then we will share, and then I might be able to pay up even faster. So with $100,000, we did $4 million of business in the first year. And this was all through uh, brokering, I mean, uh, factoring the contracts to the bank and getting them to charge a higher interest rate. And so we're leveraging in this model other people's money. The investor money, and then the investor and me leveraging the bank's money. So when you walk away from this meeting tonight and you forgot everything I say, you just have to remember two letters called OP. So OPM is other people's money. And then you learn OPT is other people's talent, or other people's time, authority, brand, whatever. Just remember, leverage on other people. And don't feel guilty. Don't feel guilty to get other people to do the work. Because while you are getting them, the qualified people are the people who likes to do what you are doing. Maybe they don't have time, maybe they only are good in a certain part of it. So actually, while you are exploiting them, you are also letting them exploit you. So mutual exploitation is called collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> so, after 16 businesses, I started to think when the recession came, I lost some money, but I still got a lot. So I thought to myself, this is a very silly game. You spend all your life trying to accumulate wealth, but after a certain point, you shouldn't. Before you, before you have some money, you have to sell your time for money. And time is the only thing you have in life. You do not have anything else in life except the number of days you are alive. Because once you are dead, you are dead. You can't do anything anymore when you are dead. Right? Some people might believe that you can go to the clouds and play some harp. <laughs> but I don't know. I think I'm just gone. Right? So, what do you do? A life is about 80 years for the man. The woman is about 84. That's roughly a developed country like America would, uh, would have. Uh, with all the obesity, it's for shorter. So what do you want to do in these 80 years? 80 years is 29,200 days. Now if you go back after this lecture, and do a countdown clock. It's very scary. Because right now you've already consumed a certain number of days. You've, you've not got 29,000 days. You get 80 minus your current age, adjust the birthday and multiply 6, 365. Now, when I started, I was 40 years old. I switched to social sector. I have 14,600 days. Now I have only 8,400 days. 
They get shorter and shorter. So, if there's anything I can promise you tonight, I just promise you that you're all going to die. <laughs> and that becomes something that will motivate you for the rest of your life because you remember what you're trying to do. If you don't do that, then if you don't find the meaning in your life, then the consumerism culture will fight for you. Consumerism culture in America is to tell you to buy the things you don't need with the money you don't have to impress the people you don't like. <laughs> and that's no meaning of life. So what, if life is so precious, then what is the best exchange? The best exchange cannot be money. Life is priceless. So the most valuable exchange I can find is love. And of course you have enough to love yourself, love your family, love your country, your community, and love the whole world. So whatever time you spend in exchange for love is definitely of a higher exchange value than with uh, money. So then you have a mission. Whatever is your mission, you may want to uh, solve uh, the nuclear crisis with North Korea, maybe that's your mission. Or you just want to uh, take very good photographs. Or you want to go diving uh, and, and record the underworld, uh, um, underwater world, or whatever. Anything that you think you can't stand it, or you're curious about it, go do it. Because life is too short not to be meaningful. So if you have a mission that is useful for other people, and you have the passion, then you have to create the legitimacy so that it's easy for other people to support you. In our case, the legitimacy is to create media visibility so that we could mobilize the masses towards the common goal. And after that, the support continues. So this will, uh, will drive each other if you keep feeling it. I first started the Restroom Association of Singapore, which is like RA subject, you know, RA movie, restricted artistic. It's got a little bit of new pictures in it or whatever. So in our case, it's also about taking off your clothes, but in the toilet. <laughs> so, so the restroom association started when I read one day in the newspaper, our prime minister says, we should measure our graciousness against the cleanliness of our public toilet. So I thought he was trying to insult us when the toilet cleaner is underpaid and not trained and the design ergonomics of the toilet is so illogical that the water is here, the soap is there, and the hand dryer is behind you and everybody is flicking their hand on the, on the floor and making it wet and then the footsteps taking the dirt out and spreading over and they are wiping the, their hands on their pants, on their hair, on their face like moisturizer <laughs> So I say something is wrong with the design, with the training of the cleaners, with the pay, and then with the behavior. So I started the Restroom Association, and I went to the press to say I'm starting this, and it went on the front page. And so everybody's re response was something like, somebody ought to have started this long ago, this is good. So that's the legitimacy. Eventually, I discovered that there are 15 toilet associations around the world without headquarters. So I offered them to have a headquarter and they say, if you do it for free, we'll join you. So you see, there's a mutual exploitation here. I want to form a world body when I'm alone, one man short and their association are all quite established and large, big and small. But they say, if I do it for free, they will join me. So
So I use their status and they use my uh, volunteer time. So in this case, we created the World Toilet Organization. <coughs> the purpose of the World Toilet Organization is to be a service platform. Remember, if you want to move a lot of people, don't be a leader. Nobody likes a leader. They want to be leader. And if you are a leader, you have to do all the work yourself. If you are a servant, you mobilize the leader. You stroke their ego. You make them work so hard that the mission happens. And you remember that driving a mission is about solving a problem, making life better for other people. It's not about you. So you better be a servant. Because a lot of time, your ego can come to become an obstacle to your mission. Especially if you're successful. Then you get famous. And then all this thing goes into your head. And fame can be very intoxicating. Just like shit. If you don't manage it properly, it can destroy you. So, money is the same. Sometimes woman. <laughs> so, you have to be always able to manage the situation. Otherwise, the situation will manage you. So, what happened here is, we serve the global toilet community. Which means everybody who is still alive. Whoever is dead, we're not really interested in them because they don't use the diet, right? So one of the proof of a living person is that he used the diet. So you should be quite happy about going there. We have the self-image, dignity, productivity. If you can go to the toilet, you're healthy. You know why? Because every time you are in the hospital, the nurse asks you in the morning, did you move your bowels? And that is, to her, a signal that everything is alright with you. But when you don't, then it starts to become troublesome. Um, physical health, psychological health. A lot of people have a fear of public toilet. There are also um, something called barorexis, where the person cannot use a urinal or a public toilet, depending on the degree of fear, that he has to suppress urination until you go home. So, when you are in primary school, sometimes you hear about a ghost in the toilet and all this. Seems to be the same rumors around the world. The guy is actually uh, only able to be in one country. People think that in the school. So we have. Return on investment on toilets. If you build toilets, the building becomes more rentable, more um, viable. And owners have to know that, especially shopping centers. If people don't stay long enough because they got to go to the toilet and the toilet is no good there, then they leave with their cash and credit card and the building lose money. Tourism. Without toilets, you cannot get tourists. So the toilet is actually very, very profitable. And then water conservation, uh, environmental pollution of the river, maintenance issue, poverty elevation. So you see, there's a lot of things that's connected to the toilet. In the university, there's no faculty that is unrelated to the toilet. Just think of whatever you're studying. It will be related to the toilet whether it's financing, or marketing, or filmmaking, or product design, law. <coughs> but currently there's a problem. The problem is that two and a half billion people in the world don't have access to a toilet yet. So imagine that, say, 40% of the, this crowd don't have toilets. So so let's say from this green man onwards to the back, everybody is squatting there, pooping while you're sitting here watching them. So that's the situation. That's 40% of the world without toilet. And it's going on because we didn't speak about it. We shut our mind 
from thinking about toilet. So if I ask you how many times you eat a day, you would know, right? You would know. So you would say three times or four times or some people seven times. But even seven times they know, right? But if I ask you how many times you go to the toilet a day, the chances are this is the first day in your whole life that you have started to count. How many times? So I'll just let you count. How many times do you go to the toilet a day? Anybody? How many times? You know? Yeah? So you start counting. You wake up in the morning. That's the first place. And then what? You know? So as you start counting, you realize that you go six to eight times a day. You spend an entire three years of your life continuously in the toilet. <laughs> so anything that you do six to eight times a day is culture. And toilet has to be good culture in order that you have a good life. So the thing that the fact that you didn't count is caused by somebody else, mostly your mother telling you, no, don't talk about it, and all that, as shown in the field. And so, when you don't talk about something, you don't improve. So, just that relationship, you don't talk about it, it gets worse and worse. Right? So, the situation with violence becomes terrible because people don't talk about it. But when you look at two and a half billion people without violence, and you think, how do I make this go away? The best way is to convert it into a business, because there's one billion of toilet here. Divide by five per family, you get half a billion toilet, and then the ones away from home, like in the school, in the uh, transport center, in the mosques or churches, temples, in the workplace, lots of toilets. This is the situation, open defecation. I took this photograph driving early in the morning before sunrise and then uh, flash the picture and I asked my friend to step on the oil. And this is all the men, this represents all the men on one side openly defecating and all the girls on another side. So why do they do it in the dark? Because of privacy. But they ought to have toilets. After that, the flies come to the poop and spread it all over. This is like a new version of the Microsoft spreadsheet model. <laughs> so you get a lot of diarrhea going on. And a lot of children dying every year. Here you have slums. There is uh, no, no space for toilet here. And so they go to the open space. Everybody likes to live next to a river because they can shit into the river. But the river used to give them water to drink, wash their clothes, wash their crockery, wash their baby, wash themselves, and drink. But now they can't do that anymore. So it's really self-destructive. This is flying toilets. They take plastic bottles, like Coke bottles, cut it into half, put the plastic bag inside, they poop over it, so that they can tie it and throw. So this is about 8 inches of poop on the floor, and I'm driving in the taxi here, and this is in the Nairobi slums, and the children are walking over there barefooted, they're playing, they touch the sheet with their hands, they rub their eyes, they put it in their mouth, they die. This is a pathetic situation. When you can't discuss, you can't improve, and our subject is not charismatic. It's not like a panda or a polar bear. So we could not talk about it. So this is how I do it. Great humor. Make it funny. This is a very sacrificial photograph <laughs> by the National Geographic Channel. We did 
a documentary, an hour documentary called The Bullet Man. We beat against 300 contestants and only six winners. So we were one of the six documentary made. So this story was a very good start for us. It tells how I started with no resource and made it. So this is other people's money, talent, authority as I explained to you. And you align all their interests and then it will be very interesting for them and also very interesting for you. Here's the first start. We get some designer in Germany and we ask them to do pro bono design of me sitting next to the trolley bag and the German pilot organization president sitting next to a dustbin. And we send the files for everybody who wants to upload it and then they print it and they make their own exhibition in the city center. So in this case, it's called Paradi Flux, it's the banking district of Switzerland. And we put it in front of Credit Suisse and Prada. Prada was very unhappy. <laughs> so we have an exhibition license, so, so we could do it. And then the people come and say, what's going on? Yeah, two and a half million people don't have toilets. And then they are shocked. So we also post uh, a picture like this inside a Ritz Carlton ladies' toilet. So this ultra high net worth people comes to this toilet in this certain shape. And they remember it. We changed the law that ladies should have more cubicles so that they don't have to queue up because in the gents there are urinals. So in 2005, all new building submission needs to have a lot of ladies' toilet. And we managed about three years ago to change the law in America. The federal buildings will, after that date, will have to have a lot of cubicles so ladies don't have to do it. But then on state law, you have to do it yourself. To do a World Toilet Summit, on the opening day of World Toilet Organization. I have no money to host a World Toilet Summit. So I told the event organizer that we'll do exhibition, I'll sell exhibition booth for him, and then we'll earn money to get a conference free of charge. And he says it's a deal. As long as you can sell the book, you got a deal. So I started calling all my friends to exhibit, and eventually we have a World Toilet Summit free of charge. Then we get the minister to come and invited 15 countries minister to join in. And then we have a really official event. After the first event, the media took it by storm. And then I don't have to do any more exhibition sale because the media is so large that everybody wants to host World Toilet Summit. So I become like the Olympic authority. I give up hosting rights. <laughs> for free. And after a while, I thought since they will spend about half a million dollars each time they host the summit, why don't I ask them for money as well? So they host my annual event and I get paid. <laughs> and who is paying them? It's the media. Because for a little bit of money, they get media value worth tens of millions of dollars. So I can get media for free and I can give them, and everybody brings including the media, because they get the story and they get the news uh, saved. So the next year in Korea, and then we went to Taiwan, then we went to Beijing, and whenever Beijing had, Shanghai had to have. <laughs> so we have uh, Shanghai, we have Thailand, we have uh, Belfast. Uh, the Clinton administrative gave some money for the disarmament of the IRA, the Irish Republican Army. And that was a terrorist group, but then they gave up their arms. So the next day, after they disarmed, we have World Weather Summit. So we use the same budget. So again, we leverage on other people's money. And this is in the Parliament House of, the, of Belfast. And we got the Lord of <laughs> Belfast to become Lord of the Rings. <laughs> we managed also to go into Moscow 
and I really don't know how to go to Moscow. We realized that the Russian Pilot Association president who used to be a KGB worker. So we asked him, can you negotiate it? And, and of course, uh, we have worked on the summit in Moscow. So even the KGB can be friends, right? <laughs> <laughs> then we have a tour of the space, space station Mir and how the cosmonauts see the uh, space and how the water get recycled. So it's really, really scientific. In 2007, it elevated to the status of the President of India. The President of India came to open World Toilet Summit because in India, the toilet situation is very pathetic. And then he came with six minister and a member of the Gandhi family. So the status of an event which cost nothing start to grow and go. And the Crown Prince of Holland came and inaugurated this meeting. Uh, he's now the king of, of uh, Holland. I don't know if it's because he supported us that his mother let him be. <laughs> <laughs> then we went to Hainan, China. We have uh, last year in South Africa. So every year, the flavor changed. The demographics of each meeting changed. And this is the Durban city mayor who's hosting it. Then this year, we have royal treatment. The city of Su Solo in Indonesia, the mayor, closed down nine kilometers of the main street uh, one afternoon and got all the students to join in. And then we have a parade, a World Toilet Carnival Parade. So this is the royal carriage. This is the warriors <laughs> driving on the toilet. <laughs> we have all the children um, half day off to do a clean toilet campaign. <coughs> we have also the army and the Mardi Gras thing. So there are other free things that you can get. You can get pro bono lawyers. Big law firm needs to do pro bono work. So you can ask them. Software, designer, architect, franchise, consultant, everything. Now I'm dreaming of having a World Toilet Museum. I just dream up something. I don't know if it will happen. So I went to a, Dutch, a, a Denmark a museum architect and I gave the idea to him. And he thought it was a good idea. He started designing it. And I told him, if one day I found somebody who wants to invest in it, I will ask him to be the architect. So he has a dream, I have a dream, we haven't got it yet. But we think if we keep on looking for it, it will happen. This, by the way, is a three toilet row, row into one. So you have the, the track on culture, technology, and history of toilet. We also got branding consultant free of charge. And we have World Toilet Summit from Singapore, Korea, Taiwan, Beijing, Belfast, Moscow, New Delhi, Macau, Philadelphia, Hainan, Durban. Next year we go to Bangladesh, Dhaka, and we just got recently booked for 2015 in Nagoya in Japan. So it's very hot. And so I get paid about 80000 every time they take my hosting right now. So, you can earn some money also, although <clears throat> the main objective is to create the change in the society. Then, World Toilet Day, 19 November, was the founding day of the World Toilet Organization, and we started to tell everybody 10 things to do on World Toilet Day. Nothing. We just say like that. And they don't always follow our 10 things, but they start to do creative things. We also have a World Toilet College. I don't have school, I don't have teacher, student, curriculum, or money, or school license. But I want to do a World Toilet College because I want to train toilet cleaners to become professionals. So I signed a MOU with a Singapore Polytechnic, and then I have the school teacher, school license. <laughs> then I, I want to bring the curriculum from Japan, 
the very good and started playing. So I can have the curriculum, but I don't have the money to bring them in. So I went to the Minister of the Labor, Minister of the Union, and I said, the toilet cleaner salary are too low, so you should increase their value by getting them professionally trained. And you pay 80,000, I'll bring the Japanese in. So he says, fine. And then we get the Japanese in, we get curriculum trainer, everything. And then we have customers. So, you know, you can leverage a lot of things. Just be audacious, just be fearless. And if you screw up, nothing. You're not going to jail. You're not going bankrupt. You're not doing anything. Just fail, okay. It's not a problem. And if you're not afraid to fail, then chances are you have a better chance to succeed. If it takes a little bit longer, so be it. We also started Sandy Shop. Sandy Shop is the last one here. We saw that the poor, you have not enough money to donate all the toilets they need. So, we teach them to start little factory to produce toilet and to sell toilet to the poor. So these are technologies that already exist and we copy them from other people. We package a training program which we train them for free. So our training money comes from donation. The donation money is also for free, right? So we train the people to run businesses and then they can grow, make profit, employ employ uh, the village woman to become a commission agent. So every time they sell a toilet, they earn two dollars, and every time he manufactures a toilet, he earns five dollars. So between them, there are jobs created, there are hygiene, health, and uh, people have privacy. So the market can run itself just by trade. How did they get money to invest to build the factory? The factory cost one thousand dollars to build and if they wanted a bigger size maximum two thousand dollars so we introduced them to microfinance people and then they run it and after 10 months they become profitable for the sales girl they don't have to invest anything we just teach them and every time they sell they make money if they don't sell they don't make money for the woman if they have some money back home they have more power to discuss situations with their husband and also they have more standing against their mother-in-law. <laughs> so these are the designs we copy from other people and we tell them that having a toilet is the door to your dreams, to your good future of the children, community acceptance and status. So we found a lot of research institutions around the world that understand toilets and sewage treatment and we group them all together call it Susanna Sustainable Sanitation Alliance. Our work get endorsed by President Clinton in Clinton Global Initiatives. So we don't know. We got invited to go to Clinton Global Initiatives and take this photograph and do fundraising together with President Clinton. So fundraising with President Clinton means you take a photograph and you go and do the fundraising. <laughs> <laughs> but it helps a lot. <laughs> then our own president, which nobody knows here. <laughs> Some awards. And Matt Damon suddenly appeared <laughs> last year. He decided that he would go on strike unless everybody gets toilet. So he broke his promise because a few minutes later he actually had to go to the toilet. <laughs> but it was very useful. And I have never met Matt Damon. But the effect is that if you create something, somebody else will take it. To be safe, I went back to the World Trade Organization at the World Economic Forum. And I met Pascal Lamy, and he says that I always tell people you are the more powerful WTO. <laughs> <laughs> so we got good friends, and I know he works for me now. Just now I saw him the lose. Yeah. Then I went to the World Tourism Organization as well. So we have three WTO now. A little bit of accolade, and in 
We used to do, I went to Central Station to give out tickets for people to go to Flushing. Send them to Flushing. It clicks, you know. So overnight, Clorox paid me $75,000 to do this gig. And uh, Lishi Nash, I don't know if you know her, she's a clean house. Uh, she's a star, TV star, and a comedian. And two of us uh, get a lot of media. And I was very happy because I have 75,000 US dollar. But then I heard that she got 300. That's <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> so Unilever, the master start. Uh, sponsoring World Toilet Day. So they say, can we give you some money and we, we name official sponsor of World Toilet Day? And I say, fine, if you give me some money, you can call yourself whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so we start to become a very good partner. On 2010, the video, the, the movie Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows opens worldwide in every cinema in the world on 19th of November. Of course, the movie maker didn't know about this. But it was a, a good measurement of our popularity. Because Harry Potter ranked fourth position on the list. And World Pilot, World Pilot Day ranked fifth position. But our budget was zero. <laughs> and their budget is probably a few hundred million dollars. And it was also very gratifying to know that Justin Bieber was ranked one not below us. Only for that day. So that film you have was from Sundance Film Festival uh, last year, and this year it opened the Cannes Lunch Festival, which is the biggest advertising um, event in the world. We start to lobby the UN to adopt it as an official UN day. So how do we get the UN to agree? The UN says, we don't like to create new days. There are so many days. There are days of the potatoes and the days for hand washing and whatever. There are so many different days. And we don't want new days. But we say, you have a millennium development goal that is failing so badly, and this will help a lot. And if you don't, it's still going on, because it's already been going on for 13 years, and every year it gets larger and larger. So the UN, you have to satisfy 193 countries, all their members. At least you need half to agree, uh, otherwise you might lose a vote. So we start lobbying a lot of countries, lunch, dinner, cafe, uh, reception and eventually we got 122 countries to put their name as sponsors of this uh, adoption and eventually when we table it we got the Singapore government to table it and it was unanimously accepted because nobody will vote if it's already more than half signed up so UN Day, uh, this World Toilet Day uh, this year, which is yesterday, uh, opens in New York at the UN, and we have the first time the UN World Toilet Day. So you see, something that we just mumble uh, <coughs> 13 years ago can rise in status to the highest uh, acceptance. So in order to leverage that, I immediately asked the Singapore government to give me land to build a monument. And uh, they gave me very good land in Marina South. And this is our logo. It's called Poo Pee and Happy. Yeah? So that's the evolution of man. It's a very easy to understand uh, visual language. And people uh, uh, can identify a bit no matter what country they're from. So I asked a donor to donate money for this sculpture is $30,000. And they say, uh, the, the way I teach to him is that the land costs more than $30,000. So you're actually getting a very good deal. And 
he was so very happy about it. I wanted to spread the message faster, so I thought writing a movie would be good. But I don't know how to write a movie. But then, I'm an expert in things that I've never done before. <laughs> so I went to Google. And the 16 step, how to make a movie. And the first step was to write a story concept and then get a script writer, then get producer, director, funding, distribution, casting, no, casting first, and then props and all that. Editing, the distribution, promotion. So a lot of things. So I thought I'll just write the concept and I sold the idea to a very famous director in Singapore and he produced this film called Everybody's Business. So on the 5th of December, it will be every cinema in Singapore and Malaysia. So you see again, you can just do anything you want. As long as you can find somebody who will kind of partner you, and that somebody has to be very com competent and very able, and you don't have to. Yeah? So not satisfied with that, I wrote a Bollywood movie. So Bollywood movie is something of a different culture. <coughs> And uh, this movie is about life without toilets. So how does a family live without toilet and all the kind of suffering they have in India? So I wrote uh, the story and I'm now getting some traction. I still need two and a half million dollars to make this movie. But I think one day I'll succeed. And how do I know how to write a Bollywood movie? It's not enough to Google. So I went to Little India in Singapore and bought 22 videos of Hindi film. <laughs> and I watched them and I start to see a pattern why people enjoy this movie. It's always this big roller coaster emotional ride of, of being very bad and then very good and then very bad again and then good again and you know. But after that you have uh, Bollywood songs and dance and uh, people who are able to change clothes every two seconds. <laughs> so if you start to design this, then uh, it will So I don't know how to play music, so I start to write poetry, and then get melody people to make it into songs. And then maybe make it into English, or make it into Hindi. So a lot of things are just small steps. Yeah. So I wrote six songs now. So next thing, after World Toilet, organization, I started to do a BOP hub. This is the next step to do something really, really big, bigger than the World Toilet Organization. Because there are 4 billion people outside our formal economy who are earning very little money, usually $2 and below. And we should be able to solve this problem by turning poverty into a massive marketplace. So this is how they buy water. How you buy water is very simple. It's free of charge. Turn on the tap and drink the water. But they have to buy water. So when they are poor, they have to pay more. Everything the poor buy, they pay a poverty penalty. So we got to turn it into business because in the first world, there's already a lot of saturation. More and more factories are coming up. Less and less purchasing power in the America and in Europe. So it's a good time to turn the attention to the poverty marketplace. So our vision is to get government, foundation, social entrepreneurs, NGO, UN group, development bank, everybody to work together. Because right now they are all fragmented and it's very, very wasteful. So this is a big coordination effort. And we dream out this world map and I recruit people to do this. I'm building also a 65,000 square foot industrial complex as a design center for the base of the pyramid. So, if there are people who are interested to solve problems in poverty, the entire supply chain is needed. Product design, marketing, financing, manufacturing, uh, branding, whatever. So, whatever your talent, I'm ready to leverage on you and let you exploit me as a test bed so that you can know that you also can change the world. Next year we are hosting the BOP oh, World Trade Convention. So this is the first time in the world that the poverty 
products and services uh, having a trade show. So what's happiness? Happiness is when you are able to decide whatever you want to do, autonomy. When you are able to master what you are doing, competence. And whatever you are doing has a purpose. So mastery, autonomy, and competence. If you have these three, you are a happy person. Then what, what is stopping us from being happy? Is the temporary happiness. Because the ones that we describe is sustainable happiness. You can keep generating it yourself. But temporary happiness is when you have to go buy something to be happy because you are not happy and you buy something and you're happy and then after a week you found that thing boring, you buy something again, you're happy again. And that type of happiness is no use. Don't, don't waste your time doing that. The other type of happiness is you eat something and you're happy. Then you're not happy, you eat again. And that's also not sustainable because after, after a while you become very fat. So, go for happiness that are continuously within your control and you don't have to spend money on it. And how do I do so many things in, in 24 hours? In fact, while doing the, all this work, I was also studying a master's degree for the first time in my life. I'm studying in a university in Singapore in, at night. So, it's a Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy and after four and a half years uh, writing assignment on the plane and in the airport, uh, I come complete with a master degree and uh, I graduated for the first time in my life at 56. <laughs> so it's never too late to study and because of that, then I now become adjunct professor in Israel, the College of Management, in Malaysia, Taylor's University, and in Singapore, the National University of Singapore. So, from somebody who failed school all the time and can become an adjunct professor, that's also quite nice. And how do you get a lot of hours a day? A lot of people are very tired because they are not doing the thing that they enjoy very much. So physical exhaustion does happen, but it happens much later. Mental exhaustion comes very early. So if you have eight hours a day at work, sometimes you have only two hours productive time. Because the thing you do is not what you want to do, because somebody told you to do. No autonomy. If you want to have more energy, you have to have fun. Whatever you are doing, if it's fun, to give you more energy. When you have more energy, you have more time and more things will happen. And then if you leverage other people to do, you can have lots of time. You can have 200 hours a day because other people are doing the job for you. So there's also another type of people who can produce negative time. They get you to do it again. They make mistakes, they create trouble and you have to do it again. So avoid those people and have fun and your life will be very, very beautiful. So after talking to you for so long, my life gets shorter, 8,400 days, and I uh, have to make full use of it. It gets more and more urgent. And so life is really short, and make your life uh, useful. Thank you very much.
and then she come back to the village to teach six students for a dollar a lesson, and she earned five dollars. So what could be so difficult about running businesses? Just remember what you learned last night and repeat it and earn five dollars. So after that, she start to buy cloth and and needles and thread and buttons and sell to uh, her students and she became a haberdasher so more and more things can happen just because you need to survive your brain will become very entrepreneurial so I saw that when I was five years old so I actually went to business school at five <laughs> but I failed in the academic school Hi, uh, my name is Maria Esquers. I actually work uh, with Ashoka at the office in Miami. Um, or to say that you're one of our fellows. And actually my question is towards that, that point that you just made about being an entrepreneur. One of the things that we do here in Miami is teach young um, well, kids and high school students and college students how to become entrepreneurs. So how do you see yourself, what's the biggest skill? How, how does somebody get to that point? I think the biggest prerequisite is that you have you are willing to lose whatever you have and you felt then nothing to lose and then your fear goes go away you don't need to be afraid to try because the other motivation is to know that you're going to die so you don't actually own anything in this life you only have an experiential journey and Whatever you do has to be very enjoyable, meaningful, and useful. And especially if it's useful for others. So just imagine that between the time you come to this planet and the time you left, and nothing happened, then why did you bother to come? You live a completely wasted life, trying to impress uh, the people you don't like. Right? So don't do that. Why is society like that? It's because the shops want your money and the government wants your taxes. So they trick you into a consumerism society, but actually you don't need a lot to, to live by. You need a little bit, but not a lot. And the quicker you understand that, the earlier you get your personal freedom. Most of the things we don't do is out of fear. We are afraid. Even buying branded goods is out of fear. We are afraid that other people have more expensive goods than us. So a lot of things have its roots on fear. You become fearless, you actually don't need a lot of things as well. Thank you so much to Mr. Jackson for joining us tonight. That was just really Yeah. <laughs>